Hey, well, you don't have any apologies today, and the chairperson's business uh, from uh, The draft was on the 8th of October last week, um, ages 7 to 19 in the pack. I remember it's okay for me to sign these uh, notes. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, in terms of matters rising, um, the follow up, the follow up correspondence from Roger Ar Armson from Lauren Port is page 21 to 23 of the pack. And we'll recall at the meeting last week that we heard from the Port representative that they have been asked a number of questions in advance um, of the meeting. And Lauren Port, Lauren Port was unable to submit their answers at the time, but have, has done so now. Um, members have any other comments that they want to make? In relation to that, are we content to note uh, the comments from Roger? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Item six now on the agenda is the uh, discussion document on environmental plans, um, principles, and governance. Uh, it's in, there's a clerk. For, there's a memo from the clerk at page 25 to 28. Correspondence from the department at 29:30. Discussion document 3159. And we'll just call that the discussion document was an item on the agenda at last week's meeting. But members agree there was necessary to receive an oral briefing as soon as possible and prior to the discussion document issuing uh, because a number of issues that are outlined in the clerk's briefing um, are at uh, page 25. I'd like to take this opportunity at this juncture to welcome via Starleaf John Mills, the head of environmental policy division and Carol Beatty, Grade 7 Environmental Build Team. I'd like the officials to um, um, commence the briefing and afterwards members will have the opportunity to ask some questions. So uh, John and Carol, if you just want to commence your briefing there, that'd be great. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, hopefully members uh, of the committee can hear me OK. Yeah, we can, yeah. Um, uh, okay, we're here today to respond to questions raised by the committee members on the uh, discussion document, as you've said. Um, just to remind members, uh, by way of background, uh, the uh, committee completed its report on the bill uh, itself earlier this year, and the bill received legislative, legislative consent on 30th of June this year. Uh, the COVID emergency has delayed the progress of the bill in Westminster and its Commons Committee stage is only due to start at the start of next month. Uh, the bill covers a wider area than the discussion document that uh, is before the committee today. Um, some of these areas have been subject to consultation exercises and others uh, will be in the future. Uh, the environmental governance provisions of the bill, um, which are in the discussion document, haven't been subject to public consultation in Northern Ireland and this is a gap we've intended to cover for some time. We had intended to publish the discussion document around the end of March, but with the COVID emergency, it wasn't appropriate to issue the discussion document. Uh, and of course, current timing uh, is hardly uh, ideal in that respect. However, time is pressing if ministers in the assembly are to be informed on the implementation of, of the... the Northern Ireland this exercise is uh, prior to any implementation. Uh, and given the lengthy delays we have already had, we are keen to publish the document as soon as possible. Uh, the discussion document focuses on three specific areas, environmental improvement plans, uh, the proposed policy statement on environmental principles, and environmental governance. Uh, which in the context of the Northern Ireland Provisions of the Bill is confined to environmental oversight as currently exercised by the European Commission. Uh, the discussion uh, uh, considers, a document considers these three elements at a high level. We're trying to keep the document short uh, for the technically minded. There is the 200 pages of explanatory notes for the bill and uh, the, the 230 pages of the bill itself. Of course, not all of that. Um, applies to the, the governance elements. In addition, some of the more detailed aspects um, of the environmental governance will be set out in subsequent documents, such as Environmental Improvement Plan, DEER is the Department's Environmental Improvement Plan, or a statement on environmental principles. 
The discussion document isn't intended to generate suggestions for amendments to the bill. Uh, the invitation extended to devolved administrations uh, when this exercise began was on the basis of uh, approximate parity um, rather than the opportunity to create bespoke uh, systems. Uh, where Northern Ireland provisions do deviate from those uh, in, uh, or extend those from England, um, the, the differences are largely due to uh, legal, technical or structural differences between jurisdictions. A lot of the document is devoted to environmental oversight. Uh, this is because it's more complex, uh, it's more complex of the environmental governance provisions and the Office of Environmental Protection has attracted the most uh, attention. The, um, so that's a background. Turning briefly to the uh, committee's specific issues uh, that were raised last week, um, this includes the lack of specific references to an independent environment agency, uh, climate change, or a sunset and non-regression clause, and a perceived potential for stakeholders uh, to be confused on the role of the Office in, of Environmental Protection uh, as compared with uh, that, the role of an independent environment agency or the existing Northern Ireland Environment Agency. Uh, I'll cover them briefly now, but um, happy to answer questions when we're finished. Um, consideration of other in, in environmental governance issues is, of course, extremely important. The commitments made in respect of the environment in the new decade, new approach agreement, uh, equally so. However, these issues are not being consulted on at this time. Uh, policy in those areas still needs to be developed and relevant proposals will be consulted on in due course. In the context of the Northern Ireland provisions of the bill, the NDNA commitments are, of course, relevant as part of the strategic overview. and We've included reference to that document, but we don't elaborate on these uh, as we're not consulting on. With regard to sunset and non-regression clauses, the Minister has said uh, in, the, in the debate on uh, uh, legislative consent that he's not minded to ask the UK government to table amendments to this effect. So the discussion document does not go into detail on these issues. However, in deference to the committee's views, uh, we do reference these matters and do provide uh, a link to the committee's report, which goes into more detail on them. Uh, while we understand the concerns about confusion on the roles of the Office of Environmental Protection and an independent environmental protection agency, to use the phrase in the uh, NDNA, we have gone to some lengths to try and make uh, it clear in the discussion document that uh, the functions of the environment agency will remain separate from those of the proposed oversight body. Uh, the there is a specific section uh, of the discussion document devoted to this, section six, and the preceding section, section five, emphasizes this point, uh, saying the principal environmental regulator in Northern Ireland is the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, which is an executive agency of DERA. It is and will remain responsible for environmental regulation. Where necessary, the agency takes enforcement action to ensure our environmental standards are met. This is not the job of the new governance body. It will operate at an oversight level to ensure that government and regulators are doing their job. An environmental oversight body is required to replace the governance functions of the European Commission and not the Northern Ireland Environment Agency. And the, the not is uh, bold and underlined. I'm not so sure how much clearer we could make this. Uh, section 10 of the document sets out the functions of the Office of Environmental protection to further elaborate on, on its role and its role being distinct from the um, environment agency. Apart from some updating to reflect the passage of time, uh, for instance, references to green growth and legislative consent, uh, this version of the uh, document before you has not changed substantially from the uh, one we sent to the committee in February. As things stands, stand if we were able to publish within the next few days the closing date for consultation would be around the middle of december uh, further delays would uh, take us into the new year realistically we we asked the committee to support swift uh, publication however uh, should the committee still consider that changes to the document are necessary we will of course uh, put this to the minister for decision uh, that concludes my opening remarks chair thanks um, thank you for that. Um, 
Okay, there was a number of uh, concerns raised last week um, you know, in relation to the NDENA and the reference to the Climate Change Act and other issues. And a number of people indicated to speak here. Um, I'm just going to go around the room. Um, Philip and John's there. Philip? Very good. Can you hear that? I mean, I understand, John, what you've said uh, in terms of an explanation, but I mean, the committee were very concerned last week. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure your explanation has uh, eased my concerns that big environmental issues uh, are being left out of uh, you know the department's document in terms of future environment plans and, pro and proposals and procedures. I mean, the, the climate issue. Uh, is the, the biggest issue uh, that we face in terms of environmental protection and it was contained in the NDNA agreement as was a specific reference to uh, bringing uh, an independent environmental protection agency to the north. You know, those are two very, very important environmental uh, governance issues that are contained in an agreement uh, with regard to uh, you know, what we would like to see the executive bringing forward. So we would particularly, obviously, like to see the, the minister with responsible for environment to bring it forward in the departmental plans and proposals that are going to go out to consultation. I mean, the other issue uh, with reference to the environment bill going through Westminster, I mean, the committee have, uh, in our deliberations, expressed deep concern that there's be no non-regression from current EU uh, legislation and I know we've been given what some would uh, maybe propose our assurances that that is the case but I mean that they aren't satisfying me I mean even that I mean the through the agricultural bill for example the British Parliament ha have knocked down three uh, amendments that would uh, maintain food standards which is uh, connected to environmental practice so I mean I don't have any confidence that the, the British government at Westminster won't re uh, regress from current EU laws so I mean as I say in terms of the document uh, the committee and, and certainly my own view is there there are gaps in it that, that would need to be filled very important gaps that would need to be filled on very important environmental issues uh well, I, I don't think we we have any disagreement with, with you, Mr. McGuigan, at all on the importance of the the issues uh, that, uh, that that you highlight. Um, it's just um, we would say not in this document, um, which is which is just performing a, a a specific role on these elements of um, of of environmental governance. That is environmental oversight for, through the Office of Environmental Protection, uh, uh, environmental improvement plans, and environmental principles. Uh, so we're we're establishing a framework, and uh, that uh, that is what we're consulting on. The um, on the climate change. Um, I think the position is that options have been uh, put to the minister, and he's considering those in terms of uh, climate change uh, legislation and on the um, uh, the, the 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 question of of, of plans for. Um, um, John, John, lost you there. Being uh, uh, the the implications and what would be required. <clears throat> Okay. Can you, you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now, John. Yeah. Philip wants to come back in here right. in a second. I mean, John, I mean, we, I mean we, we, we heard in the Assembly uh, on the, the airwaves the Minister's uh, position with regard to climate change. Now, he's obviously had a rule back from that embarrassing position. Uh, I mean, and we understand, I mean, his reticence, or we don't try, we don't understand, we, we, we know his reticence about uh, an independent environmental protection agency. Are these issues not included in the document because uh, the minister in some way is making sure that they're not in the document? No. We haven't put them in because they are not part of this consultation and because other work streams uh, are, are, are taking those things forward. Okay. okay John? 
Thank you, Chair, and thank you, John, for, for the information so far. <clears throat> um, Philip has previously there covered some of the points I was going to raise around the um, Independent Environment Environmental Protection Agency, but so, so that we can clarify, can I ask um, to, to drill down further? Are we to assume then that, that no progress at all has been made in relation to the establishment of an independent environmental protection agency and uh, there is at this stage no ministerial or departmental directive on that issue? That's the first question and I think we need to be clear because that NDNA commitment was of crucial importance to, to some of us at least. Um, there, there's another issue uh, arising for me, John, from the uh, consultation document, which is on, on page 22 in the section titled Transboundary Issues. Um, can, I, can I ask if you think it's sufficient that the questions asked relate only to the uh, OEP working with um, the, the European Commission, for example? And should there not be more recognition of the existence of and more encouragement of discussion around the fact that uh, that EU border on this island means more than, than, than just an interface. It, in fact, incorporates waterways that straddle that border, roads that straddle that border, all sorts of environmental issues that straddle that border. And should we not be encouraging more discussion and debate uh, around those issues, which um, impact the lives of those living on the border, of course, and indeed those beyond also? Um. Well, indeed, those again, those are, those are very important issues. Um, I, I think that on the coming back on the trans border, um, the uh, at the end of the day, the, the Office of Environmental Protection has a legal remit that extends to to Northern Ireland. Uh, it will um, it will no doubt uh, cooperate and, and work with other institutions or other other bodies. Um, um, and and recognise the uh, recognising the cross border nature of some of those bodies as as other as other public bodies do. So um, I, I don't think within the department there's any lack of um, appreciation of the importance of the issues you, you make. I mean they're being discussed um, uh, with uh, through the North South Ministerial Council um, in a, in a few days, for example. Um, but uh, but for this um, consultation document again, it, it, uh, I think what what is said there is, is what's necessary to to um, point out the legal functions of this in terms of ministerial directives on um, the uh, an independent um, environment agency. Uh, the the ministerial uh, direction I understand is that uh, is to assess the. Um, the, what would be needed to to establish uh, that uh, such a thing uh, and that work is being taken forward? Chair, Chair can I come back yeah. on that just briefly? Um, I, I think I know where we are on the Independent um, Environmental Protection Agency, and regretfully for me, we're not as far on from the January commitment that, that some of us would like us to be. But in relation to the, the, the consultation document and the question around what it calls transboundary issues, can I ask again, uh, Chair, uh, and John, hopefully you can clarify, is it too late to have included in that document an encouragement of issues around uh, environmental cooperation, uh, environmental protection, uh, addressing issues such as environmental crime? The, the document's entitled uh, A Consultation on Plans, Principles and Governance. I would have thought the risk, for, for example, of environmental crime um, on a cross-border basis should, should be included there for discussion and debate, what was the aim of setting up from some frameworks around that? Um, I, uh, it, it, it is it is not too late. There will be a uh, uh, there will be a cost in terms of when we can get uh, consultation out if we uh, uh, put other stuff in. Uh, but it isn't too late. I think we wouldn't want to in this consultation again. We would not want to. Um, uh, be consulting on tackling uh, environmental crime, which again is a, a, a specific area being dealt with by by others. Though I appreciate the the, the point you make about um, about frameworks, cross border frameworks. 
So we, yes, we could put additional stuff in on that, but obviously that's down to the minister. Okay. Thank you. That's fair. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering. I mean, we're all well. We all seem to be in agreement that it's a really important and critical and um, pivotal issues that we're dealing with here. And I'm just wondering, are we really missing a trick here by limiting the scope of this um, consultation? I mean, even the department um, gave this committee a briefing on the recent environmental consultation that did happen and expressed their surprise that they received thousands of responses to it. Um, but we've also moved on, so we have the end. DNA commitments, we have the Environment Bill, we have Brexit, we have this overlapping of potential agencies with the Environment Agency, the OEP, the, the Independent Environment Protection Agency. We've got the Minister saying that he's going to be scoping out um, the potential or what should be included in a Climate Change Act. Um, you're speaking about costs and workloads at the Department here as well. But I'm missing a trick that we can't do a full comprehensive consultation in one go and get the information that we all need to feed into it. Um, and I understand that workloads are really, really stretched at the minute, but those that we will be consulting um, also have equally stressed workloads um, and in most quarters are even less resourced. So are we going to head to this place where we're going to over consult the same people and agencies um, when we can do it in a, a proper full Scope and exercise here. Um, well, I think uh, there's a couple of points in there I want to pick up on. On one uh, about the question of overlap, uh, the, there is not an overlap between the functions of the Office of Environmental Protection and the uh, regulation uh, carried out by the Northern Ireland Environment Agency. Or if that in that agency was independent, the the oversight body like the, the, the Commission to make sure the government and public bodies uh, do respect the environment uh, okay, and that's sorry. what this consultation is about. Yeah, um, sorry, the overlap, just to be specific there, is if we get an independent environment protection agency, the overlap of their work and the OEP and the EA um, is very possibly going to be there. And, and that's something that we will have to consult on if it's going to happen as well. Sorry, that's what I meant by overlap. Okay, I, 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 I apologise. I, I do want to come back quite strongly on that. And the, 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 the question of whether the person who does the regulation, whether it's part of DERA as it is at the moment in the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, or if, it, if that was made an independent public body and, and was an independent environment agency, uh, that would still be a body responsible for regulation and the Office of Environmental Protection would be an oversight body carrying out its functions in either case. It wouldn't be affected by that. And in other parts of the, the uh, uh, other jurisdictions, um, of course, there are independent environment agencies, as in, say, England, and the OEP can sit very comfortably uh, with that, uh, as it can do uh, with, with our, um, our body that's part of a government department here. So uh, I, I think that's an issue I'd want to make clear and it explains why we, we're, we're specifically consulting on, um, on, on, on just this, uh, this issue. Uh, I mean, again, I appreciate the point, point you make about um, it, would be, um, it, it would be great to, to consult on everything, but uh, extremely unwieldy, there, there are um, large, um, work streams on on a lot of the areas that, that you mentioned, and in other jurisdictions, for example, um, the, the the strategies uh, on, for example, climate change and uh, the environment strategies are are separate. So I think it, uh, it would generally be accepted that it's difficult to do everything on the environment in one document. Right, sir. Okay. Thank then. you. Thank you, no problem. Um, as I have um, no other uh, members who have indicated they wish to speak, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you uh, for uh, John and Carl for your attendance at the committee meeting today. Thank you. Um, can we move on now to item seven on the agenda? Sorry. Uh, sorry? Do you want to make any comments back to Dara on that? Oh, sorry, do you want, do you want to make any comments back to Dara? Absolutely, yes. Oh, sorry, yeah. 
Mm. I mean, can I ask through yourself, I mean, just given the, the concern, I mean, is it, I mean, this is, is this us being consulted or, I mean, can the committee even beyond this actually make a response to the consultation? Do I mean, is that, would that be, no, no one minute? The committee would not normally behave as a consultee because that enough. fine grades their role. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I certainly think that uh, uh, John should take back the, the, the strength of feeling uh, heard today with regard to the issues that were raised and, and, you know, make the Minister aware of those views and the strength of feeling. If not now, then. I think on the strength of feeling of the committee and the fact that it's not quite be all the committee. I ask members of the committee. I think you need to make, the, make that clear. Some members of the committee. Enough of that, Philip? Yep. Okay. Uh, okay. So we're going to have the forest brief, uh, forest service briefing um, on their business plan uh, for 2021. Um, memo from the clerk at page 61 to 63 corresponds to department 64 65, and the actual forest service business plan at 66 to 84. I'd like to welcome Mike Starleaf, uh, John Joe O'Boyle, the chief executive of the forest service. And Stuart um, Moorhead, the uh, Grade 6, um, grade six uh, Divisional Officer, I'd like to invite the officials to commence their briefing. Right, we don't have John Joe um, online yet. Uh, Stuart, would you be in a position to commence the briefing? Uh, yes, I, I, I can uh, provide an introduction uh, just while uh, awaiting uh, John Joe. I, I would uh, just uh, like to. Um, uh, uh, commend uh, the document uh, uh, that uh, you you have in front of you. Um, uh, the uh, strategic context, as you will see, is uh, for our work on uh, forestry and uh, plant health, and that uh, sits within uh, green growth, um, uh, which is uh, a strategic outcome uh, for uh, for the department. Um, I, I think uh, uh, the uh, uh, issues that uh, are to the fore in, in the document um, are uh, around uh, uh, the Forests for Our Future programme, uh, uh, which the Minister announced uh, on the uh, early March, uh, and uh, a commitment uh, to create 9,000 hectares of woodland uh, over the uh, the next uh, 10, 10 years, uh, primarily uh, around um, uh, helping to mitigate uh, uh, issues around climate change and uh, to achieve, uh, to help the UK to achieve its uh, net zero carbon targets uh, by, uh, by uh, uh, 2050. Um, uh, th there is also a commitment around uh, maintaining uh, the plant health status of Northern Ireland uh, following uh, the end of uh, EU exit tran transition um, and uh, uh, commitments uh, around uh, continuing uh, to uh, achieve um, uh, economic growth in, in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, and uh, uh, principally uh, through uh, through uh, the continued production of, of timber and the uh, benefits that that uh, generates in in relation to uh, wood processing uh, with, uh, with within the economy, um, our forests uh, require to be uh, maintained uh, uh, and managed sustainably. And in do, doing so, um, uh, we continue uh, to provide uh, access for uh, people in Northern Ireland uh, to uh, enjoy uh, the recreational benefits uh, of, of that, uh, which uh, there is good evidence uh, that this also improves their, uh, their health and well-being. Um, the, the access to forests also provides an additional economic value uh, in, in relation to uh, uh, supporting 
uh, tourism and the recovery of tourism uh, as 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 we move uh, through uh, the uh, as we move uh, through COVID. Um, so, in, in very brief terms, uh, that, that's a, a, an outline. Uh, you will see uh, that the uh, the document includes um, uh, key targets uh, of uh, of which uh, there are. Uh, a total of eight, um, and uh, uh, supporting uh, those uh, key targets, uh, uh, there are a number of uh, supporting uh, targets as as well. Um, uh, the budget for the program is is, is outlined in, in in brief. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart. Um, I suppose, Stuart. Um, well, well, I suppose, Stuart, out of uh, interest, one of the things um, I note that. Even recently, uh, the, the service has been recently classified as a non-financial public corporate corporation. Um, can you tell me what, what what was the status before that classification, and how how does this new class, classification impact upon the organisation? Well, the, the uh, status of the um, uh, of Forest Service prior to that uh, was an executive. Uh, agency uh, of of the department, um, and uh, that had been been the case now for quite uh, some con uh, some considerable uh, time. Uh, uh, the the new status um, uh, requires us to uh, engage in. Uh, some uh, additional uh, reporting procedures, uh, uh, the detail of which uh, I, I have to say that I am not um, entirely uh, uh, familiar with as yet. Um, but it's something that uh, the uh, the agency will uh, will need to uh, get uh, uh, get to know better in the in the coming year. Over any other members, um, one of your key targets is to manage the forests. To provide um, recreational health and well-being benefits, supporting tourism recovery, and you know, I, I will say that uh, certainly in my own consistency in my own, the, the Gorton Land Forest is um, one of the, the major, well-appreciated assets that we have uh, in the district, and certainly in the whole back of the the COVID crisis, um, the whole idea of getting people going out exploring and walking in their local neighbourhoods and staycations have become a strong feature. And I note there that in your in your report that um, that new forest recreation facilities will be opened in at least three forests in partnership with the councils. And so which three specific forests have you identified and is there any scope uh, to um, look at more? You know, because obviously the whole um, the whole idea of appealing to visitors Get people out for health and well-being and staycations is will be something I think um, a consequence of of the COVID and will be with us uh, for for some time. Yeah, well, uh, certainly uh, uh, our our ambition uh, is to uh, work uh, work with the councils. I think that's uh, absolutely clear uh, uh, and. Uh, it, it does mean uh, that we are able to uh, set our uh, our work with them in the in the context of uh, the council's uh, overall strategic aims uh, of providing uh, good uh, good access um, and uh, it, it generates a very joined up uh, approach um, uh, which which is quite key uh, both in terms of the uh, Recreational um, access to local people, uh, but also um, uh, the uh, the tourist um, provision. Um, the, the the three sites, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, the, 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 there are um, a number of of sites uh, which are uh, on, ongoing in relation to uh, negotiations with uh, with councils. And uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 issue is yes we we may well be able to get more uh, than three sites, um, but um, until uh, uh, we have been able to work with our um, council partners, um, uh, we're uh, at, at the moment uh, not determining precisely which areas will uh, come forward, uh, and uh, they they will uh, be uh, become available 
uh, as we uh, as we progress uh, through through this year. But there's certainly a number uh, which are uh, rapidly coming uh, to to fruition. Thank you. We'll move around the room. Um, Harry. Thank you very much, Chair. And thank you. <clears throat> With increased usage um, during lockdown and since, as we're all advised now to meet outdoors, have sites been able to cope with larger numbers of visitors, or would, a, would um, additional infrastructure be needed at some sites um, for the demand? Well, uh, that that's certainly has uh, has has been uh, an, an issue that we've um, uh, addressed. Um, uh, we, we considered all our sites, and uh, the, the sites can contain a wide range of facilities, from uh, car parks uh, to um, uh, uh, laboratories, um, caravanning and uh, camping sites. Uh, and associated uh, ablution blocks. Uh, so there, there is a tremendous uh, uh, amount of ac activity. Um, our, our last estimates uh, were that we get uh, uh, around about 4.7 uh, million uh, day visitors uh, each each year. Um, so your question is is well put. Um, are, are are these uh, facilities um, are are they able to respond uh, to the uh, staycation and uh, the increased in, increased use uh, to ensure that our visitors are uh, safe um, uh, and uh, uh, to uh, ensure that there are. Um, uh, the necessary precautions in in place uh, to avoid the uh, the spread of uh, COVID-19. Uh, we um, before any of these facilities were reopened, uh, we uh, carried out uh, risk assessments, uh, and uh, those risk assessments included measures uh, by which we would uh, uh, limit uh, access uh, to uh, to the sites. Uh, so, for example, um, although our car parks can uh, hold um, uh, many vehicles, uh, we have uh, determined uh, a limit um, and roundabout. It's when when they get uh, between half and two thirds full, uh, we we actually close uh, close the sites to more vehicles, and likewise uh, at the uh, caravanning and camping sites. Uh, we ensure that um, uh, the numbers of users have, have been reduced, uh, not only to provide social distancing on the site itself, uh, but to um, provide um, good social distancing uh, within the ablution areas. So at the, at the moment, uh, I suppose our, our uh, immediate response uh, has been to uh, uh, ration or limit uh, access um, uh, to ensure that our, our, our visitors uh, stay safe. Um, as we work um, uh, with with others uh, in in the councils, uh, I, I anticipate uh, that uh, more facilities will be provided, uh, and uh, they they will help uh, to uh, maintain uh, what is. Um, a really important um, uh, facility uh, for people to get out, exercise. Um, it's proven uh, uh, through good uh, research uh, to be good for people's uh, mental and, and physical health. Yes, just a wee minute, Chair. Thank you very much. So basically, then at 4.7 million visitors this year, um, with a wee bit of work to do to see our numbers doubled for next year, then. But <laughs> another wee question, that's only basically many yeah. locations when the Forest Service uh, ownership are not widely known, would a publicity campaign maybe be useful to make all your sites known? Well, uh, certainly um, our, our, our sites, uh, as you, you, you've uh, sort of gathered uh, from the 4.7 million figure, um, are, are, are heavily used. And I think you're quite right in that uh, uh, some of them, um, uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of use perhaps is made 
of, of a few of sites, and the, uh, the chair mentioned uh, uh, Gorchen. Uh, uh, there are other sites, um, and just picking them, uh, you know, uh, around the country, um, whether it's uh, Glenara, for Steve Gullion, Castle Wellen, Tolly Moor, um, uh, Hillsborough, they, they, they all uh, are, are seeing a, a marked increase. And, just on, on your comments uh, around the 4.7 uh, million, I mean, we have recently, that, that was a figure that uh, uh, we um, uh, uh, obtained from a study back in 2014. Um, we have just rerun a study, it hasn't been published, uh, but early indications uh, uh, would um, uh, would lead us to believe that uh, we're, we're soon going to be um, you know, publishing um, uh, significantly increased uh, figures uh, around um, the the, uh, the numbers of, of people um, using forests, and I think uh, the the current staycation has uh, meant that people are exploring their forests again. Um, often, when I talk to uh, to folk. Um, they can say, well, I, I last visited such and such a forest when I was uh, part of a, a scout group, um, and uh, I, I, I really haven't been uh, back, uh, back since. Uh, and I, I think uh, uh, people uh, certainly will, will find it out. Uh, but we can look again at our, um, our promotion on the uh, DARA website to ensure that, uh, that these, these areas are um, sort of clearly uh, identified and uh, gives, gives people the option uh, of finding new places. Okay, thank you. Well answered. Appreciate it. Thank you, um, Chair. Ed Rosemary. Thank you. And thank you very much for your information so far. Um, your new forestry, your new headquarters that when you, you moved to Enniskillen for the forestry department, can you give me some detail on the numbers that have moved and in, that are in Enniskillen at the moment? Because um, there, has, there have been... Differing, differing numbers have been out in the media in relation to those that have moved to Enniskillen. So, can you give me some idea of numbers? Uh, yeah, yes, I, I can. I, I'm. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if you can uh, see from the uh, the video that uh, I'm uh, in the Enniskillen uh, office uh, uh, this morning, um, and uh, you know the the, the move um, from um, Belfast. Uh, to Enniskillen, I think, has been uh, uh, really uh, successful. Um, now, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, specific numbers um, uh, in, in, in the building forest service, if, if I can uh, perhaps just give you a, a, an estimate at, at the moment, and I, I may just have to come back to you to uh, correct the, uh, the precise uh, number of people. Uh, but it's of, of the order of um, uh, 35 to 40 people uh, in the forestry headquarters uh, at, at, at the moment. Um, and uh, th th those people have been uh, a combination of uh, people such as myself uh, that have uh, moved uh, from the uh, east of the province to, uh, to, to the west. Uh, and perhaps a, a greater number of people that um, uh, have uh, decided to um, uh, stay uh, in, in the East, uh, and uh, then there has been uh, uh, recruitment uh, uh, to, fill, to fill those places uh, in, uh, in Enniskillen. Um, so uh, there, there are now uh, very, very few people uh, um, uh, that uh, remain uh, in the former headquarters in uh, Dundonald House. So you're saying that there's basically a total of 40 people now employed in relation to Deer Forestry Service in Enniskillen, and there's nobody employed in the East, nobody working for the Forestry Service in the East. 
whatsoever? <laughs> no, I was referring to uh, to um, our our headquarters. Yeah, yes. Uh, so uh, we we still have uh, um, maintained offices to provide operational cover uh, in in the east uh, at uh, Castle Wellen, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there are still um, people uh, based uh, near Garva. Um, uh, providing uh, cover uh, in the uh, in the north of the province. And how many? Of, of an order uh, again uh, in in Castle Wellen, um, uh, uh, approximately um, uh, ten, and uh, of a similar number, perhaps uh, uh, ten to fifteen in in Garva. Right. Thank you. Um, can I, just one other thing in relation to yeah you. You talked about supply services and generating income from forests. Again, um, representing obviously the rural area of um, the west of the province. I get I get quite a number of complaints in relation to the condition in which roads are left after there has been a harvesting of uh, forests. Can you can you tell me what sort what sort of um, talks you have with road service etc to get these roads sorted out because very often they're left and unless a complaint is lodged they're never never sorted out yep uh, no I, I i certainly can uh, provide you with briefing on on that um the uh, uh the, we, we work very closely uh with uh, uh roads uh dfi um, uh, we will will meet them um, in the context of our strategic forest plans. Uh, that's where we plan uh, our forests uh, uh, and the the activities, uh, the services that they provide uh, in the in the long term. Uh, we also uh, uh, meet um, uh, Rhodes DFI again. Uh, when on an operational basis, uh, before uh, we go into um, uh, thin uh, or uh, fell our, uh, our our forests, um, so that they're aware of the uh, uh, the movement uh, of um, uh, timber lorries, uh, and uh, they're aware of the uh, the duration of of, of that movement. Uh, I, I really feel that uh, over the last um, uh, few years, uh, that uh, coordinated activity uh, has been um, uh, uh, successful. And yeah, in, in some occasions, um, uh, we, we are asked uh, by uh, the Department uh, for Infrastructure Roads uh, to sort of think uh, uh, about uh, other, other ways of um, uh, uh, transporting uh, the timber uh, from, uh, from the forest uh, to uh, the main uh, network of, of, of roads. Um, or um, uh, looking at uh, uh, al alternatives um, in, in terms of uh, perhaps on uh, some of the forest roads uh, or avoiding certain times of year uh, when uh, the roads uh, would be under greater pressure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hatse? Hatse? Hatse Milo, can you hear me there? I can hear him just coming online to, to get the volume up. Uh, thanks very much indeed for your presentation and, and it's, uh, it's great to hear the, the good work that's going on. I'm just looking at, at your projected figures there and uh, the plantation of uh, what is it, 18 million trees over uh, 9,000 hectares of ground. Um, first of all, um, I'm, I'm just looking at the uh, for what's the projected time frame for that, and the second bit is the availability of those nine thousand hectares. How much of those are in public ownership that are available uh, if you were to, to even try and do that plant that level of planting right now? Uh, th so that's the first bit. The second bit then is the the use of uh, of private lands and uh, the the forest expansion scheme. If you give me some sort of an insight into that scheme and if you like the incentivization that there would be 
for people within the private sector to come on board with uh, with tree planting. Okay, thank you. No, th- uh, thanks. Thanks for that uh, uh, question. I think the the, the first part of it uh, was um, uh, eighteen million trees over how long uh, uh, a period, and it it is uh, over a, a ten ten year period. Um, the eighteen million trees uh, equates to um, approximately uh, nine thousand hectares. Um, uh, so uh, if you uh, sort of uh, average that out, um, it, it works at, out at roughly uh, 900 hectares a year. Um, however, we acknowledged uh, that uh, the uptake of woodland creation in the past had been, um, uh, had been low. Uh, we were probably of an order of um, uh, 200 hectares per per year. Uh, in this year's business plan, uh, we've identified uh, a total of 500 hectares, uh, made up of uh, uh, 250 hectares, which will mostly come from uh, uh, privately owned land, but uh, uh, a bit from uh, the department's uh, uh, planting. And uh, then we have another key target uh, where we're going to plan for creation of additional uh, 250 hectares of new woodland uh, on on public land. Um, so uh, this year, um, uh, the uh, the combined figure is uh, for uh, for five 500 hectares. Um, you you, uh, you 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 ask, and I'm just uh, sort of breaking down uh, the, uh, the the question. Uh, sort of what what incentive is there for? Uh, private landowners uh, to to plant. Uh, at the the moment, um, uh, we have a, a forest expansion scheme, uh, and that scheme uh, opened uh, in in June and uh, and closed in September. So at the moment, uh, we're um, looking at the applications uh, and uh, ass- assessing them, and we will then be in touch with the if, with those applicants uh, to indicate uh, whether or not they're they're successful. Now we've had a very encouraging increase in applications uh, this year, um, so we've had around about a uh, hundred uh, applicants, uh, and uh, uh, they're applying for. Um, uh, 550 hectares uh, of uh, support for for new woodland uh, creation. Uh, so I, I think that's a positive move, and I think part of it uh, was as a result of the revision of the forest expansion scheme, uh, which allowed uh, smaller areas of, of woodland to be included, um, mm-hmm. and a lot of that increase uh, came from uh, people wanting to plant uh, between. Uh, three and five hectares of of, of, of woodland. Uh, later on um, uh, this year, um, uh, uh, we'll uh, also um, uh, develop um, uh, a new small woodland grant scheme. Uh, this is very much aimed at people who really want to plant um, uh, almost half an acre, 0.2 of a hectare um, on their holding. Uh, more or less to complement their agricultural business. Yeah. It's not instead of it, it's to help them um, perhaps uh, uh, address riparian areas, so areas close to streams and rivers, which might be getting poached and they, they need to keep the, uh, the animals out of. It, it might uh, help address issues of accidental diffuse pollution from, from the farm. Um, and it might also help sort of deal with that very steep bit of ground, which is perhaps quite hazardous to get a tractor on and uh, uh, means that it would be better in, a, in, another, in another land use. Um, coming back then to the other side of your question uh, about the, uh, the public land, uh, and that's both uh, departmental and, and, and council uh, land. Um, mm-hmm. it, 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 at, at the moment, um, uh, we have drawn together an, a forestation forum. Uh, we, we have got um, uh, uh, nominees from councils and departments. 
uh, and we'll be engaging with them now very, uh, very soon um, uh, to enable them to record the areas which they think uh, are suitable and we'll uh, do this on a digital spatial database um, uh, which the participants will contribute to. Uh, and then we'll be able to provide them with a bit of advice as to the suitability of the areas that they've identified for uh, tree planting. Uh, we'll make them aware of the support. Uh, councils can draw down um, uh, uh, support uh, under the Forest Expansion Scheme and Small Woodlands Grant Scheme. Uh, and uh, that, that will enable them uh, both uh, uh, you know, in the coming planting season this winter uh, and subsequently uh, to, um, uh, to, to add uh, to the uh, woodland cover. I think your specific question was how much uh, woodland is there in the public sector that might come available? Uh, well, uh, it, it, uh, the, the, the simple answer to that, until we have uh, uh, got feedback in terms of the spatial data from councils and from uh, departments, uh, we, we, won't, uh, we won't really know. Um, uh, so that's the, the first job we, we have to do, uh, determine uh, what there is and then help people um, uh, to and support them uh, to create the woodland and um, just outline all the benefits, not only you know, the carbon uh, benefits uh, that a lot of councils are now very aware of, um, <coughs> but all the access issues, uh, um, uh, that people really do enjoy forests. Uh, forests can absorb uh, a, a lot of people. And talking to uh, councils um, across the country, the, the cost of providing uh, forest recreation is, uh, you know, they, they tell me that it is particularly cost effective. Hmm. Okay. okay, thank you very much indeed for that. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, Patrick, uh, John. Thank you, Chair. And f following straight on from, from that uh, mention there of councils, and I, I know you yourself touched on this earlier as well, but can I ask, um, not to go over ground that, that's already covered, but is there anything that could be done in conjunction with councils to put in place interim measures or facilities for public use uh, and enjoyment in the absence of or until the time there are uh, formal joint management agreements, access agreements, or whatever formal structures are needed? Um, and are put in place. I'm thinking of Randallstown Forest in my own area, for example, where people have contacted me about um, the, the, be the benefit it would be if there was a seat or two in there for them to, to take a rest, um, to ensure that shelters that are already there are maintained properly. And I'm asking this, of course, so that we can harness the environmental awareness and, and the enjoyment of the countryside that has come as a perhaps unexpected and one of the very few benefits of the, the COVID period. An additional question, and not, not unrelated, can I ask what is being done to encourage uh, the growth of native species in any programmes that are taking place? We're all very grateful for the Forest for a Future programme, but I'm keen to know what emphasis there, in, that there is on native species and what work is being done with other environmental agencies uh, or volunteers, for that matter, to... Uh, join up and work together on the, the issue of native species and um, habitat enhancement. No, uh, th th thank you. Thank you for that. So uh, if uh, I can uh, take the, uh, the, the first part of your question, uh, uh, specifically in relation to, uh, I think, um, uh, uh, providing uh, uh, publicly uh, accessible facilities in forests um, uh, in, in the absence or uh, while um, uh, agreements uh, with the uh, local with the local councils are, 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 are moving moving forward and I think the, 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 the really important thing that, that, that uh, certainly I, I have learned over the, um, uh, the, the the previous years is that um, Working with um, uh, the uh, the councils, uh, working with council, um, you know, councillors and council officials, is is a, a really important uh, to be able to most effectively target uh, where 
the uh, recreational provision should be in place. The, the difficulty is that if a forest service uh, goes ahead and uh, uh, does it, 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 it isn't within uh, the uh, necessarily within the council's strategic fr framework uh, for providing uh, access to the, um, uh, the wider environment, uh, and it, it risks sort of putting the, the, the wrong things in the wrong places. Uh, so I suppose, uh, you know, in answer, to your, in, in answer to your question, of course, you know, if, if we're uh, talking about uh, uh, sort of a, a very minor um, uh, changes, uh, uh, that, that's one thing. But in terms of the, you know, the very successful working we've had with, with the councils, um, I, I think that is the most effective way in which we can provide uh, thought through and strategic approach uh, to allow people in the council area, uh, you know, to access uh, access their their forests. Um, just on the second point, um, in terms of uh, native native species, um, there's sometimes uh, a uh, Perhaps preconception that uh, uh, that, that people, uh, it, perhaps myself included, uh, in, in forest service are are more interested in um, in, in purely in coniferous forest plantations, and uh, I, I always have to indicate that uh, we, we are really keen in encouraging um, creation of all types of of woodland, um, uh, whether they are. Um, uh, uh, coniferous or broadleaf or uh, mixed or as you've pointed out uh, particularly uh, native native species uh, I, I think uh, you know, we all have to think about the forests that we create today uh, are um, uh, hopefully going to be here in a in hundred years time uh, so we do have to create forests that are uh, resilient to the to the climate change uh, that uh, we, we we do expect uh, to occur, uh, and uh, we do have to think about trees uh, a greater diversity of trees. Uh, we do have to even within it within a species, uh, we do have to think about uh, trees of again um, uh, a greater genetic mix. Uh, we have to think about um, perhaps larger woodlands, which are more resilient uh, to, uh, to climate change. Um, and not forgetting uh, the, the, issue, the specific issue that you've raised, uh, that we do have to uh, encourage uh, native trees, but we need to encourage them from a, a wide range of uh, seed sources uh, that are well adapted to the current uh, situation and are adapted to something which uh, those same trees will uh, will face in uh, 50 years time when they're with them when they're mature specifically on encouraging native uh, tree species uh, we we are um, uh, going to uh, launch uh, uh, later on this year as I mentioned earlier uh, a, a new small woodland grant scheme and really that is that that is entirely aimed uh, at uh, native species, uh, because those um, small woodlands, uh, particularly along uh, river corridors or uh, on uh, uh, areas of steeper ground, uh, they're ideally suited uh, for a range of native species. But you know, we do have to bear in mind that our native species are are not immune uh, to disease, and uh, you will all have seen. Uh, the impact of ash dieback disease, and unfortunately, um, uh, over the uh, next few years, uh, the scientists tell us uh, that we're going to uh, see the loss of a, a significant component of uh, ash trees in our landscape and in our forests. John, you want to come back? Yeah, very quickly, Chair. Um, and the detail may have been lost in the length of the question, so I apologise for that. But uh, the the working with other agencies or volunteers to to encourage oh. restoration of natural habitat, native species, none of those things. Keep to know more about that if it exists. 
Yep. Yes, uh, and certainly, uh, you know, we, we, we do, and my apologies, uh, I, I did admit that. Um, uh, we, we work with uh, a wide range of other, uh, um, uh, whether they're in environmental, uh, non-governmental organisations, uh, such as the uh, Woodland Trust uh, and uh, uh, the, the Wildlife Trust, um, Wildlife Trust at the moment in, in relation to um, uh, priority species such as red squirrel, uh, Woodland Trust um, in relation to a uh, current uh, project which is around creating uh, one of the largest new native woodlands uh, in, in, in the Morns, uh, so we're working closely with them. Uh, other agencies um, were working with uh, Northern Ireland Water uh, with uh, a pilot um, uh, restoration uh, site. Uh, it's a peatland restoration site on a, a former plantation uh, and uh, we're, we're working closely uh, with, with them in relation to the environmental benefits that that will uh, produce. Thank you. Okay. Uh, William? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, again, I for one would welcome the close cooperation with the local councils. I think it mm -hmm. certainly has been very successful. Uh, Gosford Forest Park and Market Hill have been one of them. It just created one other problem with a parking issue, but that's <laughs> as you're probably aware of. Um, in relation to forestry supplying 400,000 tonnes of timber to um, processors in Northern Ireland, what area of woodlands involved in that, and is that to really plot it each year? Or what, how do you, is, that a, is that yearly or not yearly? I just, just yeah, to, yeah. To, that, uh, yes, that, that, that's our uh, yearly uh, supply um, uh, of uh, uh, effectively their logs, uh, which are uh, either uh, cut in our forest by our, our customer and uh, they are then uh, sent to bill or and uh, the, the other alternative we still do um, some cutting ourselves and uh, uh, sell the, uh, the timber at uh, roadside uh, and we, we, we sell that uh, to, to the mills. Um, it, it really is a, a significant uh, uh, it's a significant volume in terms of the uh, the, the income uh, it, it generates, uh, but in, uh, it, it also has significant added value in terms of the, uh, the wood the wood processes. Um, so it's of of an order of uh, sort of fifty to sixty million pounds in terms of the primary processing is generated in the local economy. Uh, and uh, uh, the value that comes back to the, the department is of the order of uh, uh, sort of 10, 10 million pounds. Uh, um, it's uh, uh, every working day, if uh, it's uh, a very um, back of an envelope calculation, but every working day uh, there, there are about uh, uh, 100 uh, timber lorries uh, that uh, move from uh, the forest uh, to, to the sawmills. Does that does that forestry have to replant it each year then, or? Yeah, yeah yes, uh, that that uh, uh, generates uh, uh, an area of clear fell of approximately uh, uh, eight eight to nine hundred uh, hectares, uh, and uh, the uh, the large proportion of that is uh, regenerated. Um, either by uh, direct planting um, or in some areas we allow, um, going back to uh, the, the previous question, we allow native uh, broadleaves to regenerate uh, in, in specific areas uh, to create uh, greater diversity with, uh, within the forest. So there is a large program uh, associated with the uh, regeneration of the, the forest as a result of the timber harvest. Certainly it's a big operation. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. You. Um, Philip? Thanks. Uh, and apologies, I had to step out for a while, so hopefully this wasn't asked. I mean, just in terms of your key targets, uh, four and five, uh, falling under the theme protect uh, plant health status following the EU exit transition. I mean, these targets have a deadline of the 31st of December. 
Can you maybe provide an update on the progression of how these targets uh, are, are going along and outline any concerns that, that you may have with the dual approach uh, that forestry services require to implement both EU and, and UK framework for plant health controls? Well, I, I, I have to uh, admit that uh, my, my colleagues, who I think uh, you, you will be seeing in, in the next um, uh, uh, session in, in relation to um, uh, legislation on, on plant health, uh, will be able to give, uh, uh, give you a, um, a much more succinct uh, up update uh, than, uh, than I can uh, uh, on, on, these, on these matters. So uh, my, my apologies if, if I can uh, defer to uh, their much uh, more detailed uh, knowledge on, on the subject matter. Um, Claire? Thanks, Chair. Uh, um, thanks, and hopefully these will be quick ones as well. I'm just wondering, uh, do you know what trees are, are currently grown for commercial um, processing um, and whether we'll be expanding that remit or sticking to the same that we're using at the minute? And also then, will the, the private commercial um, tree planting that happens at the minute, would that be included um, with that 18 million planting in the 9,000 hectares um, within the plans? And then the last one is, what's the balance at the minute between of that 9,000 hectares um, between what will be used as commercial or processing timber and, I suppose, more settled woodland for public and biodiversity use? Mm -hmm. Well, if, uh, if if I can t take take your uh, questions in, in in reverse order, sure. um, I I think the uh, the, the last one was uh, of the nine thousand uh, hectares. Um, uh, how how much is going to be? Um, uh, I, I understood your question. How much is going to be um, uh, perhaps uh, coniferous and how much uh, broadleaf? And uh, I, I think my, my response to that is that uh, uh, that that, uh, uh, that it uh, will be dependent on um, the the land which is coming forward for for planting. Um, in general, um, if uh, the, the land availability is of uh, is is fertile and sheltered, uh, it will. Generally, favour broad leaves, um, uh, and uh, it it can grow good quality uh, broad leaf uh, trees. Uh, the, the issue at the moment is for a, a private owner; uh, he he needs to then work uh, harder uh, to find a, a market for those uh, eventually. Um, on if if land is uh, more more marginal, more exposed, and and wetter. Uh, it, it will tend to uh, support uh, more coniferous species, uh, and uh, they, they may be the, uh, uh, the species of choice. So, uh, really, in answer to your question, no, I, I can't say uh, you know what the breakdown will be. It will very much be dependent on uh, the land that becomes available, and of course, you know the, the owner's objectives in in in, in planting in planting that. Um, the the type of trees. I'm going back to your first question. The type of trees. Um, uh, they will, in terms of the uh, the uh, the timber species, as perhaps you can describe them. Uh, at the moment, that's uh, uh, dominated by um, uh, spruce, in particular uh, uh, Sitka uh, spruce. Uh, and uh, we, we still have uh, a lot of uh, pine, um, uh, described as a, a logical pine. Um, in the future, um, will, will that change? Yes, it, it will change. Uh, so uh, again, uh, to ensure that we're building in a much greater resilience into our future forests, um, uh, we will be looking for a much greater diversity of coniferous species, um, and uh, you know, it, it is uh, considering issues around climate change and and, and disease that we do need to uh, con uh, consider that uh, diversity of species. I think in the uh, the other question you had in relation to the eighteen million, can you just remind me 
uh, what uh, what uh, 18 million trees yeah sure it was just to ask um will current private so any um private enterprise that currently grow for commercial will that be included in the the current sort of figures to get the 9000 hectares or 8 million trees 18 million yeah, yes uh, my my apologies for You're forgetting right. that um the, the uh, yes uh, the 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 9000 target um uh, will be a combination of um uh, public uh, and and private planting um, and the public planting uh, will include both councils and um, uh, departmental uh, land. Um, the private planting it, it is uh, uh, the vast majority uh, of it uh, tends to be uh, from uh, from from farmers, uh, but we also have uh, others from you know community groups, uh, schools. Um, uh, health trusts, uh, or, or any anyone who has uh, access and an interest in in land, uh, you know, we we will uh, be encouraging them to uh, create new woodland. Thank you, uh, Morris. Morris, anyway. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, all the questions I had have already been answered, but. Uh, I'll just make a point that this is the 20th anniversary year of the Woodland Trust and their valuable contri contribution across Northern Ireland along with the Wild Wildlife Trust cannot be underestimated. But I was pleased to hear in response to your question from Rosemary that consideration has been given uh, in regards to working interdepartmentally with the other departments across Dormant to ensure the planting of trees etc is included along the roads, but could that be expanded to include uh, planning applications and the use of trees and bushes in future planning developments. Uh, I also don't think I've ever made any secret of the fact that I have a preference for broadleaf trees as opposed to coniferous, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm well aware that some trees are more suited to settings than others and some are more preferential for harvesting than others. But another benefit of enhancing the, the forest is the protection and expansion of wildlife and wildflowers. And suppose, like many people across Northern Ireland, I'm concerned about the spread of the grey squirrel and its direct threat to your native red squirrel. But my question really is in regards to the riverside planting along the River Ban. The River Ban flows through my constituency. Uh, it's liable to flooding and erosion of the banks. Uh, I think that's due to the high volume of water and the flow coming out of Loch Ney uh, as it makes its way down through Core Rain to the river or to the sea. Uh, so I was wondering, is, is there a a real concentrated effort to try and have trees planted right along the, the river banks to protect the banks and, and combat erosion. Uh, no, th th thanks uh, for uh, for those questions. Uh, if I can t again just take them, I, I think in the order you uh, you asked, and my apologies, and if if I miss one out, uh, bring me back to it. Uh, the, the first, uh, I think, question you asked was around um, uh, planning uh, and uh, the, the the real benefits of having um, trees uh, uh, associated with uh, plant. And development and I, I, I think uh, you know open space uh, associated with planned development it has been shown to be very effective uh, not only in terms of making areas uh, look attractive uh, but also to allow people uh, to uh, take some exercise close to where they live uh, and benefit from uh, those um, uh, health and, and well-being uh, 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 associated with um, accessible open open space, um, and certainly, uh, you know, I, I, I would in, encourage um, uh, planners to uh, uh, almost as part of the uh, the planning gain uh, to uh, 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 you know to uh, uh, stipulate uh, uh, woodland. Um, it, it, it has the advantage that it uh, is not as expensive to uh, 
as a as a piece of uh, uh, cut uh, cut grass. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's something clearly for for, for the planners. But uh, I, I think the benefits of open space in in planning is is is, is now well understood. Um, you, you you mentioned um, uh, uh, issue of uh, wildlife and. Um, Gray squirrels, in particular. Uh, I mean, uh, forests uh, uh, do um, provide habitat for a very wide range of uh, priority uh, species and priority habitat. Um, uh, but as ever, um, uh, there are uh, uh, occasional uh, invasive uh, uh, ex exotic species, and uh, the uh, the gray squirrel is one uh, that unfortunately has uh, has moved um, and has uh, been uh, very very successful. Uh, a native of of, of North America, um, it was introduced into uh, Ireland almost uh, uh, well over a hundred years ago now, and has 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 spread. Um, it does uh, not only uh, uh, do damage um, uh, and almost sort of re replaces the native red, uh, but uh, as you're well aware, um, can uh, do quite considerable damage to broadleaf uh, uh, woodland. Uh, so um, uh, the uh, you know. Uh, as a as a landowner, uh, the uh, the department uh, is uh, involved in uh, active uh, active control, and as uh, you know, working with the uh, the wildlife trusts in supporting the red squirrel numbers as as well. And I think it's uh, I think it's that uh, that combination uh, that, uh, that 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 really is in, important. Uh, to uh, to address the uh, the gray squirrel problem, um, you mentioned flooding um, uh, and issues uh, uh, along the the, 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 the river ban. Um, uh, there's again been a lot of uh, scientific um, research uh, done on the contribution of woodland to help mitigate flood risk even before it gets. You know, to uh, uh, to the bigger rivers, and clearly um, it has benefit in stabilising banks and uh, uh, preventing poaching uh, from from livestock. Um, uh, the Forest Service uh, um, a few years ago worked uh, closely with uh, forest research in a, a study uh, around how uh, forests, new forests, and woodlands. Uh, can uh, mitigate flood risk, and we focused on uh, our piece of work on the um, Camoan and Drumra catchments, uh, just uh, uh, that feed into the uh, Struel at Oma, uh, and uh, it, it it indicated how um, afforestation of parts of the catchment uh, can help uh, uh, reduce uh, the flood maxima in in, in Oma itself. Uh, and uh, at least help. It's not a it's not a panacea, uh, but help um, uh, reduce the problem. But your comment again around uh, bankside erosion, yeah, uh, we we can see uh, that uh, uh, particularly willows are are, are very uh, tenacious, um, and uh, uh, will 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 happily uh, grow on on on, on bank sides. They can be coppiced and uh, perhaps allow for um, uh, river maintenance where necessary, uh, but we know they'll grow again very rapidly uh, from the coppice shoots and secure, uh, secure the bank. Um, I think your, your other point uh, was uh, you're, you're in favour of broad leaves, and, uh, uh, and I, I think the, 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 the mantra um, is really the, the right tree in the right place. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it is. Uh, it is really. It is really important, and we can see lots of examples um, uh, where, almost in a in a more uh, urban or suburban situation, where uh, a tree has been perhaps uh, a large stature tree has been planted in the wrong place. Uh, and it uh, creates uh, uh, the individual tree creates no end of problems. Um, so uh, it, it is uh, it, it is all about uh, uh, planting the right tree in the right right place, and that's where 
uh, Forest Service uh, in terms of its strategic planning. We plan very carefully uh, the future of our forests. We consult uh, with, with the public uh, and with organizations and uh, it, 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 uh, we, we lay out how we intend to um, uh, perhaps design our forests for, for the future because a lot of these forests were uh, established in the um, uh, 60s, 70s and uh, uh, once they are uh, clear felled there's opportunity to change the design, change some of the species um, and uh, that, that's uh, something that we really appreciate people's comments on. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Okay. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you. Robin and Harry. Thank you for that, man. Again, Chair, appreciate it. Appreciate all your answers, Stuart. Very interesting. Um, just maybe a wee tiny bit more detail on the small woodland scheme. Uh, you said like about half acre or so. Is this scheme, it sounded like in your description that it was possibly only available for farmers, the way you were describing it, but would it be available for homeowners that maybe had? half an acre or so, and also, when will it be coming out and where could we get detail? Because I've been asked about schemes like that, Stuart, so it just would be yeah. interesting to push it. Thank you. Yeah, yes, uh, I mean, it, it, uh, it, it is um, uh, 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 a scheme uh, which, uh, as I said, will uh, uh, allow uh, all those with uh, interest uh, in a piece of land and uh, just to uh, provide you with uh, assurance it's not um, uh, purely uh, f f farmers it, it is all those that uh, are landowners or have a long-term interest in in the land and <coughs> have permission from uh, their landlord uh, to to go ahead so uh, uh, whether it's uh, uh, a school you know, uh, 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 or um, uh, a church, other organisations who simply have have the available land, uh, they'll, they'll they, they 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 will be eligible. Your 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 next question, uh, quite rightly, is uh, when uh, is 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 this scheme going to be launched? Uh, and uh, uh, that, that in the um, uh, the business plan, we've uh, identified the uh, the target date of. Um, prior to the end of this calendar year. Uh, and uh, that will uh, allow people to um, apply. And I think as you had uh, I I indicated as well, uh, I'm aware of uh, an anticipation uh, for this scheme. Uh, there are a lot of people that uh, are, are really keen which, uh, to, um, uh, to find out more, more about it. Um, and I'm sure the minister uh, you know, will, uh, will wish to um, be engaged in the uh, launching of uh, of the scheme, and to say we, we will um, uh, get get this out um, uh, in time uh, to allow people to plant the trees in the in the winter planting season. Thank you, Stuart. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, for, thank you, Stuart. That was a um, very detailed answers and. Um, very robust. So, thank you. Very, very informative uh, presentation. So, okay, uh, we're going to move on now to the next item on our agenda. Um, item, be item eight, uh, and that's the consideration of the SIs. And I want to commit the committee to a note that there are seven SIs today, and um, it's not been possible to group them. To group them, and each one will need to be considered individually. An hour has been allocated for the committee to consider, consider these SIs. A written briefing is offered for Category 1 and reserved SIs, but officials are on call if required to answer questions. A, a short three to four minute oral brief will be provided for Category 2 SIs, followed by a short period of Q&A. Uh, a 10 minute oral briefing will be provided for the Category 3 SIs, followed by a more detailed Q&A. The officials will brief on the following SIs, uh, APH20, APH06, APH11, and we'll have Neil Callaghan, Christopher uh, Andrews, and Tommy McNamara. Also, a AQ04 and a ENV23, we'll have Colin Nugent and Caroline Barry. CFP20, David Steele, Patrick Smith and Kieran Cunningham. Um, and we'll also be looking at the ship recycling, etc., and Anthony Courtney. So, are members content with this approach? 
Okay. So, okay, so item item eight then uh, is the the DERA um, the DERA uh, SA DEFRA uh, the, sh the ship recycling um, facilities and requirements for hazardous materials in the ships and ship EU exit for twenty twenty. Every two. Uh, the correspondence from the department is 86 to 88 near PACS, background paper in 1990, and the memo, memo from the clerk is 24 to 27 in the table of papers. I'd like at this juncture to welcome Anthony Courtney, uh, Grade 7, um, Waste Legislation Branch. I'd like to ask Anthony to give a three to four a minute overview on the regulations, which will be followed by members' questions. And um, Okay, Anthony. Anthony? Anthony, we can see you, but we can't hear you. Hello, Anthony? No. We can't, uh, we can't, it's not working. Mic turned off, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, Anthony, can you check if your mic turned off? Because we, we, we can't hear you. No, can't. Well, should we go on to item? On to the next one, maybe come back. again, try again. Okay, we might have to come back to Anthony. Um, um, after we will move on to number nine, item nine, because um, we, we can't we can't hear you at this present name. So item nine on the agenda is the oral evidence uh, on the seeds amendment EU Ex Regulation 2020, category two. The memo is at page 35, 36, and corresponds to Department of 38 to 41. Of the table of papers. I'd like to welcome on to, st on to Starleaf uh, Tommy McNamara, Staff Officer, Environmental Farming Branch. Tommy, can you hear us? Tommy? Tommy, can you hear us? Yeah. Will, we, will, we, will we just sort of go into closed session and try and get resolved? Yeah, that'd be a good idea. We'll go into closed session and see if we can resolve this technical hitch. Okay, folks, uh, whilst we're getting the technical hitch resolved, we're, we're going to move on to some of the other items whilst, whilst the technical um, issues are being ironed out. Uh, so, item 18 corresponds, uh, pages 234 to 275-year pack. Um, I want to draw your attention to correspondence on page 248 from a member of the Youth Climate Association requesting a meeting with the committee. It isn't clear from the correspondence whether this is a request from the individual or the association. So members content that they are contact to ascertain who is wishing to, um, to to meet with the committee. Okay. Yep. I want to refer to correspondence at 255 from the EU Affairs Officer regarding the publication of the SA which defines the NA qualifying goods for the purposes of unfettered access. Can I ask seek agreement to forward this to the NA Business Regs of Working Group for comments? Okay. I want to refer to the item of table correspondence of 50 to 58. The deep department's uh, correspondence in relation to SICMO 18, Common Market Organisation of the Markets and Agriculture Products, Miscellaneous Amendments, EU Exit Number 2 Regulations 2020. Members will recall that the SA was on the agenda at last week's meeting, but was not considered as the department did not provide any papers, although officials did give a short briefing. Uh, the SA is expected to be laid today, therefore this stage is just for the committee to note. However, the department has stated that following scrutiny of, uh, of near final drafts, officials are content to devolve content and this SA does not contain substantive policy changes. However, given the interest that stakeholders in the committee have in the content, the committee may consider this to be Category 3 SA. The Department can provide a further briefing on the policy aspect of members. Are members content to action the remainder of the correspondence suggested in the index page 220 and 232? Okay. So I want to refer members to the forward work program item 19, page 232. Is there no reply to the letter we sent last week in relation to the spread and slurry? Yeah, that's right, that was an urgent uh, issue. Um, can we just it's, want that followed up, Rosemary? It's just disappointing, yeah. given the urgency of it. Yep, yeah, absolutely, because to, today is the day. <coughs> um, so, the draft work programme, for work programme 277 281. 
Uh, one of the ways that the effective questioning workshop has now been organised for Friday, 6th of November at 9am, and this will last for about an hour. It'll be a virtual workshop using the Starley facility. Members are asked to advise the clerk if they will be attending so that the necessary arrangements can be made to issue the Starley for invitation. That's the 6th of November. I want to advise members that a virtual uh, informal meeting has now been organised with grassroots mountain bikes for the 20th of October at 1pm. And can I ask members to confirm now whether they will be attending the meeting so that the Starley Foundation can issue this week? Uh, me and Philip have already agreed to attend. So members, can members indicate now till Stella? What's the date again there, sorry? It's the grassroots uh, mountain yep. bikes. On what date, sorry? Claire, it's the 20th. Tuesday, the 20th, lunchtime, 1 o'clock. Lunchtime. I'm in the same as last time, business committee, so I'll join after. Yeah, I hope you go. Anybody else want to attend? So Philip, myself, Rosemary, William. That's your marshery. Okay. Here on, I'll get up to it again. Yeah, Morris, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep, thank you. And did you want something else for November or something? I mean, the, you want a confirmation? The effective uh, questioning workshop. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's the second. That's okay. the second. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Stella, do you want to do you want to brief the committee on the forward work program? Yeah, I just again want to cover the twenty second, uh, which is next week, and then you've a week off for 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 Halloween. And um, so there will be a, a briefing on green growth next week, um, an oral briefing on green growth um, next week, and um, we'll be taking this first, followed by one, and I'm still trying to clarify what this one is on SPS issues and animal health and welfare. Um, I know they're showing us four SRs down there for next week, but actually there's only going to be three SRs. They'll be coming at SL1 stage. Um, we're still trying to clarify if there's any SIs coming next week. Um, and then I've also asked for, we'll be doing it in, in, in committee in closed session, looking at what the committee want to do for November, December. So um, just trying to clarify what, what legislation Dara ne uh, Dara needs to bring to us and therefore what what ability then the committee has to do the things that it would like to do rather than uh, his, um, his okay so we're doing that in a closed session probably next week okay okay so um so are we okay with that forward work program um i suppose if there's if there are any particular issues you want to raise you can do so now well under any other business? We know the next meeting will be next week anyway at, at 10am. 10, at 10 it's the later time of 10am. Yeah. Okay. So, do we have any update on the thing yet? Okay. Um, Chair. Sorry, Patsy, go for it. Yes, Patsy. Please. Yes, yeah. uh, would there be any opportunity to find out just the the payment the support payments for uh fisheries for uh, that's offshore and in, onshore inshore uh, fisheries when when those payments are going to be uh, processed and got out getting queries from fishermen from Loch Ness here just in that so if we if we could have some indication on that please from the department yes Yes. Uh -huh. That's no problem, Patsy. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to just reverse back again uh, to um, to item eight on the agenda. Um, again, twenty, is, uh, which refers to page uh, page eighty six to eighty eight and twenty four to twenty seven on the table papers. Uh, wonder can we get Anthony Courtney back on again uh, via Starley for a three to four minute overview? On the regulations. Go on, sir. Um, what about the um, oral evidence for the seeds amendment regulations, category two? Uh, Tommy McNamara, staff officer of Rare Metal Farm Bands. Morning, Tommy. Um, excuse me, 
and I just disconnect my phone because Lost you, Tommy. Keep one close to you. Yeah, try, try number ten. Try Stephen Stevens. Okay, we're going to try the um, Marines and Fisheries. Can David Steele, Patrick Smith, or Kieran Cunningham hear us? No. Tommy, can pa yeah. can, can any of you hear us? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, I. Is that Kieran? Let me see, Kieran. Let me see. I can hear. I can hear. Have you got Anthony yet? Anthony Cunningham here? No, Anthony. Courtney, no? No. Oh. Okay, we'll go on to number 10. Okay, number 10 on the agenda, right, is the um, uh, oral evidence, DERA SI DEFRA CFP20, the main marine and fisheries implementation regulations. The correspondence is page 94 and 95 in your packs, and there's no information on the SI and written briefing at pages 96 and 97. Um, no information on the SA and the written briefing at 9697 which details the latest position. There's a memo from the clerk at pages 28 to 29 of the table pack. Uh, the department has since advised that DEFRA lawyers have redrafted the title of the SA to read the Common Fisheries Policy Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2020. Despite having no template in front of us, can I suggest that we hear the evidence from the officials as this is an important policy area. So I want to welcome by Star Starleaf. David uh, Steele uh, from the Fisheries Bill Team, Patrick Smith, Deputy Smith Principal, Sea Fisheries Policy and Grants Bill, Kieran Cunningham, Grade 7, Acting Head of Marine and Fisheries Transition Team. I wanted I, I wanted you to take a, in around 10 minutes to give an overview of the regulations, and members will then ask questions. Chair, uh, it's David here. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, great. Thanks, for the, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, with your with your permission, I'll take some time just to, to set the scene uh, for CFP20. Uh, the committee should be in possession of a written briefing which the department provided uh, at the end of last week. Uh, this briefing essentially uh, set out where we were with DEFRA's drafting of CFP20 um, as of Friday past, which is less than a week ago. Uh, we sent this to the committee uh, in an effort to keep you updated uh, on what has been a constantly changing uh, picture with regards to CFP20. Uh, it was clearly right and proper um, that the committee should be kept informed about what was happening with the CSI. At that time, last Friday, we were simply not in a position to guarantee uh, that CFP20 uh, would be in a sufficiently finalised form to present a further paper uh, on its detail to the committee this morning. Chair, I'm conscious that the committee still doesn't have this second paper in front of it uh, in order to discuss the detail of the SI. But during the past few days, we have worked to develop that further paper, but unfortunately we have been unable to get it to the committee in, t in time for today's meeting. I'm afraid uh, the, the, the clock uh, beat us. Chair, I know that I'm unable to get into the detail of the SI, uh, because you don't have that uh, second paper in front of you. Uh, but what I will say is that when the committee sees it, you will find that CFP20 is a much reduced version of what DEFRA had intended initially. Uh, and, and that is entirely down to the time constraints uh, faced by DEFRA. But unfortunately, um, as we can see, those, t those time pressures impact on us all. I can only apologise that this is the position, um, but it is completely outside uh, of the department's control. I can't, em I can't emphasise enough uh, that, that it's outside of the department's control. Um, Chair, you've, you, I think you just mentioned earlier there uh, uh, that because of the changes uh, DEFRA has made to this uh, ESI, uh, they have advised us that uh, there will be a, a new title uh, and I think uh, you, you mentioned that it would be the Common Fisheries Policy Amendment, etc. EU Exit Number Two Regulations 2020. Uh, the number two in the title will distinguish it from the title of the CFP12 SI, uh, which the committee noted at its meeting on the 1st of October. I mentioned that uh, here simply for the committee's information uh, and in moving forward. Uh, 
Chair, uh, I hope that explains uh, quite candidly uh, where we find ourselves with CFP20. Uh, we will, of course, get the detail on this SI to the committee as soon as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. Patsy, did you indicate you want to speak there? No, I hadn't indicated to speak, Chair. That uh, it wasn't lowered after the last time. That's up from the last time. Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, again, I want to thank the officials uh, for this here. And I suppose, given the fact that the template hasn't been received for uh, for this essay, the the, the 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 committee can't consider it. You know, given that the template hasn't um, made it. So, uh, thank thank you very much for that. Um, the okay number eleven is the oral evidence uh, um, air quality NA protocol regulations 2020. Um, the again no papers have been received for this SA, uh, and again the committee can't uh, can't consider it. Uh, can I advise members of the department brief the committee on this at last week's meeting, and the SA has been laid at Westminster today. Therefore, it is uh, the committee to note. Is that okay. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Item 12, uh, oral evidence, the animal health and welfare amendments, etc. Regulations 2020. The department has now advised that the title of the SA has changed to the Animals, Aquatic, Animal Health and Seeds Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2020. Uh, I want you to refer to I want to refer you to the, the papers in the department of pages 43 to uh, 46 of the tabled papers and a memo from the clerk at 30 to 30 to 32 of the tabled papers. Um, I'd like to welcome by Starleaf um, Naomi Callaghan, Acting Director of Animal Health and Welfare Policy. Naomi, can you hear me, Naomi? Hello, Naomi? Yeah. Naomi, can you hear yeah. me? We can see you. Can, me, can you give a, a three to four minute overview, Naomi, of the regulations and then members will be able to ask some questions? No problem, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak to this um, exit, this exit SI. Um, so the committee has written, written, written briefing before it, but I can provide a, a short overview as requested. Um, the SI is drafted on a UK-wide basis. And this is because, for the most part, it amends earlier UK-wide EU exit SIs, which were made by DEFRA. Those SIs would have amended EU law as it applied across the UK had it left the EU without an agreement. Um, and as we know, that didn't happen. An agreement was reached, and this statutory instrument, or SI, ensures that the statute book reflects that agreement. For the most part, the SI addresses how EU law relating to animals or animal or animal or aquatic health will apply in Great Britain GB following the end of transition. So when doing so to a large extent, it essentially removes Northern Ireland from the amendments made by the previous EU exit SIs. And this is necessary because under the withdrawal agreement, Northern Ireland must remain aligned with EU rules specified in the Northern Ireland Protocol. So to give you an example of the types of amendments that this SI makes is that it, it replaces references to UK in the previous EU exit SIs with references to GB. Um, it also ensures that functions of the European Commission under the relevant EU laws are transferred to authorities in GB, but not to authorities in Northern Ireland, as that would contravene the protocol because the European Commission will have continuing role here. So most of the provisions in the SI, as I've said, are GB related, but it does make some technical provisions relating to seed marketing, competition rules governing equines and animal breeding that do extend to Northern Ireland. So on the seed marketings, the SI amends provision in an, e in an EU S exit SI related to the seed marketing directive, which is not included in the Northern Ireland protocol. The amendments are required to maintain the effectiveness of the national regulatory framework that would otherwise be partially inoperable and unable to function after transition. In relation to the horse competition rules, the SI corrects an error in a previous EU exit SI. That exit SI brought a derogation into UK law that it was outside the powers conferred by the EU Withdrawal Act. So this SI removes the offending provision 
and the relevant amendment applies to Northern Ireland because the EU legislation to which it relates is not listed um, as one that Northern Ireland must align with in the protocol. The SI also makes some technical changes to EU laws on zoo technical breeding standards. Again, the relevant amendments apply to Northern Ireland because those EU laws are not listed in the annex to the Northern Ireland Protocol. And in terms of timing, the committee will wish to note that um, this SI is due to be laid in Westminster on the 21st of um, this month. So in summary, the changes that the SI makes are technical. Um, they ensure that the relevant legislation can operate at the end of transition. The department considers that this SI that this SI to be the appropriate vehicle in which to carry these, these Northern Ireland amendments because it amends UK existing wide, leg, wide legislation. This will ensure the consistency of approach and will also make the most efficient use of resources, something we consider particularly important given the timings involved, the sheer number of volume of legislation as the committee knows to be brought forward between now and the end of the year. So the minister is minded to consent to this SI extending to Northern Ireland and the committee is asked and to get whether or not it is content for the minister to give that consent. Um, we're happy to take any questions that the committee um, would like to ask. Tell you all it is, the, the list of varieties available here in Northern Ireland, but that's, uh, that list isn't available in the GB. What's the implications on seed marketing when it would get to that stage? I'm just wondering, is Tommy McNamara on the line there? Tommy was um, Tommy's responsible. He's the lead on seeds. Yeah, um, yeah Tommy, is that a question that perhaps you could answer for the committee member? Yes, is, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Uh, yeah, sorry, apologies. I had to join by phone. I just had to give up the video link. No, it wasn't working properly. Um, this particular SI doesn't actually deal with varieties, that is the previous SI that I didn't get talking about would be APH20 when we're talking about varieties. Um, I don't know if, if you do plan to discuss APH20, it may be best to revisit it at that stage rather than in connection with this SI. That's okay, that's fine, yep, sorry, thank you. No problem, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you for that, Tommy, and thank you uh, for that, Naomi, as well. Um, are members content that we note the SI and use the agreed form of words that uh, we agreed um, last week, um, previously? Uh, the committee wishes to be clearly understood that due to lack of information on SI DEFRA APH11, the Animal Health and Welfare Amendments, etc., EU Exit Regulation 2020, Carrier 2, the limited time that it had to consider it, has been able to fully explore and understand the potential impacts and implications to this jurisdiction. The legal is being further compounded by the fact that it is being asked to do so in the context of legal uncertainties around the UK and internal market bill and withdrawal agreement. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, item 13 in the agenda, um, oral evidence, uh, APH009, Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board Amendment Order 2020. Um, um, can I refer our members to the correspondence of the Department at 101 to 103 and the memo from the clerk which has been tabled in your papers at 33 to 34. Um, members, any questions? Chris O'Rangers is on standby if anybody has any questions to ask in relation to that there. Okay. Okay, um, so our members, are we content that we, we, we note the SA and use the agreed form of words as, uh, as agreed previously? Yep. Okay. Um, so with item 14, oral evidence, um, the Environment Miscellaneous Amendments Exit Regulation 2020, Category 1. We haven't received papers for this SA, and we can't, as such, we can't consider it. Uh, the department, I want to also advise the department brief the committee on this SI at last week's meeting, and it has been laid in Westminster today, and therefore it's just for us to, to note. Is that okay? So commit, that completes our consideration of the SIs, and we'll now move. Oh, sorry. Maybe go back to number back eight and nine. Number nine. I was working at pace there, so it was Barbara. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, want, I need to move back now uh, to item 8 and 9 in the agenda because we did have a technical glitch earlier on. Um, and that was the, uh, the ship recycling um, um, facilities and requirements for hazardous materials and ships, regulation 2020. That's at pay, um, pages 86 to 88. In the back, 
round paper is at 89 to 91. Anthony, uh, can you hear us now to give us a three or four minute overview of the regulations? Tommy, are you there? Tommy, can you hear us? Yes, I'm here, Charles. Yeah, Tommy, well, we'll just could you, we'll, we'll go and maybe look at the, the seeds, um, the seeds amendment, EU exit regulation 2020. As a, uh, for the members, it's 35 to 36 of your table papers and 38 to 41 of the table papers. There's a memo from Stella and there's also more uh, additional correspondence. Tommy's here now on my phone. Tommy, could you, could you give a three or four minute overview of uh, the re this particular regulation and the members, if, if they wish, to can ask some questions? Certainly, certainly. Um, well, this is a UK-wide SI which the Minister has minded to give consent to approve the making of the regulations, uh, which will apply to Northern Ireland. Um, the committee are asking to agree whether for the Minister to provide consent, and a briefing paper has already been provided. Uh, Council Directive 2002-53, which relates to the common catalogue varieties uh, of agricultural plant species, and Council Directive 2002-55 on the market and vegetable seed, require member states to maintain national lists of varieties uh, of seed. These directives also require that the acceptance of a variety onto a member state's national list equates to acceptance onto the EU common catalogue of varieties. And only varieties included in either a national list or a common catalogue may be marketed in a, in a member state. Under the terms of the withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol, it was determined that relevant EU legislation will continue to apply directly in Northern Ireland after the end of the implementation period. Both of those directives are included in the two of the protocol, which means the department will be required to maintain Northern Ireland only variety lists. Only varieties of seed that are on the Northern Ireland variety list are included, and the EU Common Catalogue will be marketable here in Northern Ireland at the end of the implementation period, and as such, the UK national lists are no longer set for purpose in Northern Ireland. Um, although the varieties in the Common Catalogue will continue to be marketable in Northern Ireland, this will not be the case in Great Britain. This SI amends the, say, the national list regulations, UK wide national list of regulations, uh, to revoke their extent to Northern Ireland. The Department will shortly bring forward its own legislation to create Northern Ireland only variety lists. And the creation of these lists specific to Northern Ireland will ensure that industry will not be affected and that the status quo will maintain insofar as is possible. The SI also amends. Um, previous EU exit legislation uh, that provided for the payment of fees in regards to variety listing. Uh, and this is to differentiate between the newly created GB variety list and the Northern Ireland variety list. It also makes consequential amendments to previous EU exit legislation which are applied in the event of a no deal. Uh, and to that extent, what these amendments do is they merely reflect the narrowing of the extent of the regulations to Great Britain only. The SI doesn't make any policy changes. Uh, the area is devolved, which is why the Minister's consent is being sought. Um, I'm content to take any questions if you have any. Members okay? That's okay. Yep. Tommy, thank you for that there. Um, there's the members are, are, are content with your um, explanation there. Um, thank you for that, Tommy. Uh, is, there, um, is Anthony... Anthony here at this stage. Anthony um, uh, Courtney. Are you able to hear me now, Chairperson? Oh yeah. Is that you, Anthony? Yeah, that's me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank. Thank. Well, sorry. I just conclude the, the the previous one. So, a members content that to note the uh, seeds, uh, the, the 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 seeds amendment regulation, uh, with the agreed formula words that we did previously. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, we'll just go back. Uh, Anthony, thank you there. Anthony, the, the Ship Recycling uh, Amendment uh, Regulation 2020, um, could you give us a three to four minute overview of that regulations and if, uh, for members and if they want to raise any questions after it? Yes, I can. And apologies for the, the technical difficulties earlier on. Um, okay. uh, thank you for the opportunity to brief the committee on it. Um, I'll give a brief overview of the purpose and the content of the SI, and including some brief background to give it some context. Um, it's a short UK-wide SI, which contains both reserved and devolved content, and the Department for Transport intends to lay the SI later on today. Um, 
The purpose of the ASI is essentially to ensure that Northern Ireland can continue to comply with the requirements of regulation the EU 1257-2013, which is the EU regulation on ship recycling. And this is necessary because it's a requirement of the NI protocol that, that Northern Ireland continues to comply with that. The EU regulation itself provides the basis for improving environmental and safety standards in respect of the recycling of EU flag ships. And while a number of aspects of the EU regulation relate to reserve matters, one of the key elements of the EU regulation is to require that EU flag ships are recycled at an approved ship recycling facility on the EU European list. Um, for Northern Ireland, regulations were made in 2015, which designated the NIA and the Health and Safety Executive in Northern Ireland as joint local competent authorities to authorise ship recycling facilities in Northern Ireland so that they could be added and, and included on the European list. Um, so, in preparation for Exit Day, in 2019, some amendments were made to the, the 2015 Northern Ireland regulations and to the EU regulation itself so that UK flagships will need to use an approved ship recycling facility on the United Kingdom list, which is to replicate the EU list. The 2019 amendments also replaced and updated some references um, in terms of EU member state and references to the Commission, etc. But because of the fact that the EU regulation is, is listed on the NI protocol, some of the amendments made in 2019 needed to be revisited and in some ways reversed. So in summary, what this SI does is it reinstates the European list of facilities for EU flagships in respect of Northern Ireland. So the 2015 NI regs are revised so that, as is the case now, Northern Ireland facilities are prohi prohibited from accepting an EU flagship for recycling unless the facility is on the European list. Um, along with ship recycling facilities in the rest of the UK, Northern Ireland facilities will not be able to accept any UK flagship after IP completion day unless that facility is included on the UK list. But it's important to recognise that the UK list will mirror the EU list. Um, so one of the other changes in the SI is that the competent authorities in Northern Ireland, which will be NIA and the, and the Health and Safety Executive, will need to inform the Secretary of State about the status of any NI facilities on the European list if the status changes. So for example, if a ship recycling permit has been renewed, suspended or withdrawn, and then there will be an onus on the Secretary of State to notify the European Commission of any such changes. The SI then also makes some very minor operability amendments to the retained version of the EU regulation covering reserve matters, but again that includes um, placing a requirement on the Secretary of State to inform the European Commission about any changes to facilities in NI. Um, so at the moment and in the past couple of years there's only been one NI site on the European list which is Harden the Wolf. And the effect of this SI is that it can remain to be treated by the EU as a facility with an equivalent status to facilities that are, are located in an EU member state, whereas the, the facilities in the rest of the UK will have to go through a different process to get re-added onto the European list. So ultimately, um, there will be no real change after the transition period compared to now. Um, but the, 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 I suppose the positive impact is that it will be easier for NI facilities to gain access and remain on the European list in comparison with those facilities on the, the UK mainland. And, and that's, that's the crux and the, the basic um, impact of the changes in the SI. So that's probably all set at this stage, and I'm happy to take comments or, or questions from members of the committee. Uh, th thank you, um, uh, Anthony. Um, I suppose to j just uh, see here in, in the north is the only EU recognised ship recycling facility. Is that hard to move? Is that right? That's right, yes. It's the only facility on the, the European list uh, in, 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 in no, from Northern Ireland, yes. Right, right. No problem at all. Is members, any other any questions or questions up there? Um, well, thank you very much. Sorry? Oh, sorry. No, it's sorry. Okay, it's okay. Thank you. No, it's fine. Uh, just to say Hi. I'd welcome that. I mean, it, to me, that would seem like there's opportunity for Harlan and Wolf there. I haven't read through it all, so I think that should be good. Thank you. Yes, yeah, I think that it's, I think that's an important point. I mean, essentially, what it does is it, it, it continues to allow Harlan and Wolf to be on the European list, and therefore it, it should be open to you know taking on more business from from in terms of recycling um, EU flagships. Yep. Thank you. Brilliant. Yep. Yeah. So, members, content to note that one as well. Okay. 
Um, so, Anthony, thank you very much. I'm glad you got in there before uh, uh, the attacking of Hitches previously. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for your patience, Chairperson. Uh, no problem. Take care, Anthony. Thank you. Um, okay, folks. Um, okay. Oh, Fourteen, should yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, number fifteen. Then the uh, written briefing from Dara, uh, the Plant Health Regulation 2020. The correspondence is page 106 to 109, and the draft SR is at 110 to 173. Regulations are subject to negative resolution and will come into operation on the 30th of November, subject to uh, committee approval. Uh, the, um, the purpose of the SR is to revoke and replace the Plant Health um, Official Controls Miscellaneous Provisions Regulation 2019, which the committee approved on the 3rd of March 2020, as DSO has since advised that it contains unnecessary legal references, which now need to be revoked and replaced with further EU implementing decisions subsequent to the 14th of December 2019. The SRL also include notification requirements for seed potatoes from Britain, an exception in relation to uh, of notification requirements for solid fuel uh, wood originating in Ireland, and the following temporary emergency national measures is agreed with DEFRA in the absence of increased controls in the EU. An update to the regulations of Agrilus uh, plan of one of his uh, firmer, uh, which is Emerald Ice Borer, containing specific measures uh, for imported ice trees and ice and import and movement requirements for almond trees for planting to prevent the introduction of can candidatus um, yellows. Consultation took place with uh, UK businesses and stakeholders, and no objections were raised. Is there any uh, comment from the members in relation to this here? Are we, are we okay? Are we okay to the with the merits of the policy? Thank you. Uh, item 16, written briefing from DERA, marketing of fruit and propagating materials. The documents, the correspondence, the department 175 to 177, the draft SR 178 to 80, the quality human rights screening template at 181 to 205, rural needs assessment 206 to 214. I advise members that the purpose of the SR is to amend the marketing of fruit, plant and propagating material regulations NA 2017 to implement the Mission Implementation uh, Directive 2019-1813, which amends Directive 2014-1960U with regards to colour and content of suppliers doc, uh, document. The SR is subject to a negative resolution will come into operation on the 30th of November, subject to the agreement. Members, any comments in relation to this from here? Except, Chair, maybe very briefly, when it tells us that there's no consultation being carried out because it wasn't required, is there merit in getting some clarification or oversight on would even a limited consultation with uh, partners be advisable so as to um, assess economic and business impact? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and I suppose one of the things I noticed as well in relation to this particular one, there has been a, a full Section 75 assessment carried out uh, and, mm -hmm. and rural needs uh, assessment as well. You know, um, with the Coup Finance Department, you know, uh, how, how, why is that the case? And not, I'll come to the fact that it's not the case in some of the other SRs. Every SR for the PSL1 should have a the SIs don't. Oh, this, sorry, this is this is an SR, isn't this it? This is our own legislation. It's our own, right. So they're complying mm -hmm. with our law. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So are members okay with, members okay with the merits of this particular policy? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a written briefing from Reyes at the uh, in your packs as well at pages two sixteen to twenty nineteen to two nineteen. Um, and that's agriculture support, and then there's one on the ETS on page 20, 20, 220 to 227. 
These two additional briefing notes were provided at the request of members after the presentation on the proposed EU EKS. Um, are members okay uh, or have any questions or is in relation to this research paper? Okay. Okay with the research paper? Okay. Right. Well, thank you very much. So, so unless there's any other business, uh, I'll start there. Um, we will meet again next week, Thursday 22nd, at the later time of 10 a.m. here in room 30. So I will... Uh, Oh, sorry, William. I just thought I'd seen John Joe Bailon. No. Oh. Seemed to be him. I, he was on the screen a second ago. I nearly saw him. Just thought maybe there was a reason. Well, I think yeah, he's there. there was John Joe Bailon. He was meant to be in the forestry service one, but he couldn't get in. I see he's trying to get in right away. Yeah. That's okay. No, no, just the only car. I just seen him on the. Bus <laughs> fellas. <laughs> just thought maybe he hadn't picked it up or <laughs> Well, okay, thank you, William. I'm going to adjourn the meeting now, okay? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee.